tonight's meeting. Um, first thing I guess on our agenda is to uh, call to order the public hearing for what I believe is the last public hearing for the municipal plan update. Is that we correct? Hope so. Yeah, we hope so. Um, so having said that, I'll turn it over to Steve. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Uh, Ken Belbo and Mary Cohen were planning on coming, but um, they're not here on behalf of the Planning Commission. This is really your public hearing, so um, why don't we move ahead and if they if they show up and, and their questions directly <coughs> to the Planning Commission members, uh, fine. If not, I would be glad to speak to that. So uh, this is, as you know, is your second public hearing. Uh, you held a public hearing back on October 15th and uh, took public comment. Um, there was some very good comment at that meeting, I think, especially related to uh, the housing task force or working group and energy uh, working group. And uh, we can certainly follow up on that, that there is language in the missile plan. I've got uh, three copies here. So if anybody in the audience is interested in a copy, please uh, come and get it. And if, uh, if any, um, Here's a copy for the select board. I didn't make a lot of extra copies. I've passed them out before. Yeah. So, uh, but we definitely have copies here for reference if, if that's necessary. So I think what I'd like to do is just give a quick recap and then turn it back uh, to you uh, to ask for public comment. That's really the purpose of the meeting. It's, it's extra. That's one copy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, 10 minutes to read it. <laughs> There'll be a quiz at the end of the hearing. No, just kidding. Uh, so um, one of the reasons that this document is, uh, is fairly large is that uh, we produced an energy plan. Um, we were required to update our energy chapter to be in conformance with the States Act 174 that um, was uh, passed a couple of years ago. And um, we... Um, also had the option of having a local energy plan. So um, that plan was um, produced with the help of the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission and is um, incorporated in this draft. And it's really designed to um, show where we have preferred areas for certain types of renewable energy facilities. Uh, the plan is designed to help meet the state's goal of uh, using um, or have, having 90% of the energy use in the state um, be um, from renewables by the year 2050. That's the target. And our local energy plan includes local targets to achieve that. Uh, we really can uh, say what our preferred mix is for renewables. Um, every town is different in terms of geography and suitability. Uh, we, knew, we know that uh, solar energy has certainly been very big in Waterbury and uh, mo most of the rest of the state over the last um, 10 years or more, both on a commercial scale, uh, municipal scale, with the uh, facility, the half megawatt facility up at uh, the Wellfield on the Sweet Road, and uh, for private individuals. Um, hydro is... Um, been a factor in energy generation in Waterbury for a long time with the uh, Waterbury Dam. Uh, we now have a micro facility that's in our water main on uh, Galpel Road. So you may have uh, noticed the new facility there. Most of it's, uh, the workings are underground, but uh, that uh, facility is, is operational and is converting the um, uh, excess uh, pressure in the water main uh, that we would have to just reduce and uh, dissipate as energy into electricity. So those are some examples. Um, the other aspect of the plan that uh, the Planning Commission member, uh, members worked long and hard at, we've got uh, Ken Bellavo, the chair, and Mary Cohen, the vice chair here, um, to answer any questions that you might have. Um, the other aspect that um, we addressed is um, forest fragmentation. Uh, this. Uh, was required in Act uh, 171 by the legislature. And um, as uh, we've said before, the, the intent of this municipal plan is um, 
is really not to prohibit development in forested areas, but is to design to uh, try to minimize the impact of development, especially in some of the important forest blocks, uh, especially where there's uh, wildlife connectivity. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of the Shootsville Hill area. I opened my um, complimentary copy of Nature Conservancy magazine that had a Vermont section, and there was an article on the Shootsville uh, Wildlife Corridor in uh, Nature Conservancy magazine for everybody in Vermont that that goes to. So I think that kind of speaks to the importance and the uh, high profile for that area. So, um, so we've incorporated uh, language, uh, goals and objectives and actions into the plan relating to the uh, Shootsville uh, Wildlife Corridor and to other areas around town. Uh, as I think you know, the Planning Commission is in the midst of uh, a zoning update and the municipal plan provides the basis for our zoning and subdivision regulations. And um, so the, some of the uh, goals and actions uh, that are in the plan will be um, reflected in uh, some of them are reflected in the current uh, initial draft that the Planning Commission is, is working on. So uh, the other aspect that Bill helped us with uh, to a large degree is uh, reflecting the fact that the village of Waterbury uh, no longer exists as a municipality and those assets have uh, been taken over by the Edward Farrar Utility District and are overseen by the district's commissioners. So we've reflected that uh, fact in the municipal plan. We talk about our public facilities and uh, updated that aspect. Much of the plan did not go through um, a, uh, a rewrite or, or any kind of major rewrite. We certainly uh, corrected language that dealt with um, references to the village, taking that out. Um, but. Um, we did a major rewrite in 2013, uh, utilizing the 2010 census data. We'll do another major rewrite um, sometime after the 2020, 2020 census. And uh, but there are key areas of this plan which were were clearly rewritten. Uh, one thing that uh, people interest you. Um, this is now a plan with an eight-year life. Uh, legislation passed about four years ago, five years ago. It was right after we did our 2013 plan, I think, um, not too long after that, as I recall, that um, changed the requirement for municipal plans in terms of the expiration uh, to be an eight-year time frame with a check-in at the four-year mark with our regional planning commission looking mainly at implementation. So I think that's something to be aware of. Uh, we can amend either sections or the entire plan prior to the expiration in eight years, but, it, but it's not required, um, other than the, uh, the check-in process with the Regional Planning Commission. So did, do either of you have anything you want to add before we turn it back to the select board for uh, get public comment? I think I caught most of what you were saying. Okay, good. It sounds like a great idea. We're in favor of the plan being approved by the select board conclusion the public hearing. So if I recall, uh, back at the, the last public hearing, uh, there was a decision not to change a whole lot of the language and get into the weeds of any other issues. Uh, we basically just kind of tightened this, the last draft up and, and uh, presented it as, as a final. That right, right. So there weren't any um, any changes made to draft number two. Um, the discussion primarily focused around uh, implementation of the draft, and um, we had incorporated language dealing with the, um, both the energy task force and, and a housing working group. Uh, the housing working group was already in uh, the 2013 plan. Uh, we got a lot of input from Waterbury Leap on um, language that went into the Planning Commission's final draft, and um, so that uh, energy task force is incorporated in, into this draft. So there, there weren't any substantive changes to the draft. Um, in order to have this draft adopted, we can't make any uh, substantive changes without holding a, another public hearing. 
Now, um, I want to thank Ken and Mary and the rest of the board for doing a spectacular job. I mean, five years is a pretty short window from the last time to now, and it's good that eight years is the next uh, time frame in which we have to redo this. Hopefully, uh, things won't change a whole heck of a lot. Um, I had a gentleman, I often listen to DEV and the programs there, talk programs. I had a gentleman on the other day talking about the Compre Comprehensive Energy Program. Um, he's talking about, uh, uh, <laughs> what's wrong, Bill? No. Oh, um, carbon tax. Oh, okay. And uh, I had done some reading on the Compre Comprehensive Energy Plan that uh, Duncan McDougall had sent to me a link to it. Mm -hmm. So I read into it a little bit. Um, they had some great graphs and in, in, uh, conversation there in, in writing on how we were going to get to the end game of 90% renewable by 2050. Um, and I spoke to the guy on the radio the other day and, and uh, made some comments about the effort to move forward with this comprehensive energy program and the fact that the information that they gave to how we're supposed to achieve the end game, but there was no real information about the impact on the switchover, how much carbon is going to be introduced into the atmosphere by moving in this direction and uh, information as to how long it would take to, I guess, even tip the scale even to a point where after the renewables are put in place to achieve this 90 percent, uh, you know, how long does it take to get to that point and then how long afterwards before we start to have to invest money and time uh, and resources back into either maintenance or upgrades in the systems, the force fragmentation issues involved in wind turbines, just issues that I felt were important to, you know, putting us in a direction that's really going to make an effect. Uh, the guy didn't have any answers as to my questions as to, you know, the lack of, he, he basically said that, you know, we don't have everything worked out. <clears throat> well, the, having said that, I'm thinking to myself, so is this actually going to do the job? You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And now with the carbon tax, uh, their efforts to kind of push that hard, you know, there's implications on that that are going to affect us uh, in more ways than one. And, uh, you know, will the carbon tax, do you have any opinion on how the carbon tax will affect this plan moving forward? Uh, is there a possibility we might have to revisit that in four years to try to you know, offset or, or comply with the regulations that they'll, they may put forward, you know, dealing with the carbon tax? you have an answer for that, Ken? Or? We do. Do you? Whether it's a good, good. one or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Can you go to a mic, please? Either. Oh, yeah. That would be good. Yeah. So, I think the question How's that? Is that good? Yeah. Good. Thank you. So um, we did not discuss um, the institution of a carbon tax. And so it was not part of our discussion. We haven't had any discussions about it whatsoever. Um, you know, whether or not the state of Vermont institutes a carbon tax, I don't know that I would uh, consider that to be a fait accompli. There's probably some discussion about it, um, but there are no states in the country, as far as I know, who have instituted a carbon tax. And there is a lot of debate as to whether or not a carbon tax would actually be feasible and could be administered satisfactorily at as small an increment as a state. And, and of course, we are one of the smallest. Um, I, I also know that there are some individual communities that are discussing this. Um, I, think, I think all of that, uh, those are good discussions to have, but this idea that it's imminent, I don't know that I would necessarily think in those ways. Uh, my own personal opinion, and this isn't the opinion of, of the Planning Commission, but my own personal opinion, is that 
if there were going to be a carbon tax that were instituted and it was going to be effective, it would need to be um, uh, enacted at, at an increment that's greater than an individual state, and especially a small state like, like Vermont. I mean, if we were California, uh, you know, we could, we could drive things in a very, very different way. Um, but, so, so it hasn't been a part of discussion of the plan. It may very well be that the discussion that you heard um, ends up being the case. And four or five years from now, it, it may cause us to revisit our plan and think about some additional implementation strategies for how we would help to reach those goals that the state has established in the state energy plan. But um, at this point, I think this is all, it's just discussion. And uh, I don't even know that there has been a piece of legislation that has been introduced. Now, maybe after we get to January and the new legislature takes, uh, takes their seats, that may change. But at this point, as far as I know, there hasn't even been any, any legislation that has been introduced. Thanks. But the short answer is we didn't, we didn't really, we didn't really take it up. We were looking at things, I think, in a, it'd be fair to say, in a more broad brush sort of way. Yeah. Well, I mean, from my understanding, uh, the state house is now basically contro controlled by progressives and Democrats, and I think you're going to see a harder push towards probably implementation of some of these issues, you know, some of these goals, I guess. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see how things turn out. Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. Um, my other concern, the only other concern I had, and it's just for discussion here, is uh, Shootsville Hill, um, that specific corridor. Um, you know, my concern has been right along the development ability of that part of the forest, uh, the impact of residential housing. Um, from what I understand, there's there's not much that can be done to to protect that from future impact? Is that my understanding? Well, so I think the, um, commission the is strategy, and we don't have any members of our Conservation Commission here, but um, the, the Conservation Commission is part of a um, coalition of groups with the Stowe Land Trust, with the um, Vermont Land Trust, Stowe Conservation Commission, and uh, their, their approach is um, certainly to work voluntarily with landowners that are interested in doing conservation projects. And there has been um, you know, a significant amount of uh, conservation that has, has been done in that area. And um, so it's, the, the program is a voluntary program and uh, education is a big component of that. So I think um, kudos to those groups for working with the landowners. But I don't think uh, the plan certainly doesn't anticipate um, uh, pressuring people. Uh, I think where the Planning Commission will look at these issues, not only in the Schutzville Hill Corridor, uh, or Schutzville Corridor, but in other areas, is um, what we can do through zoning uh, especially in our higher elevation areas to um, minimize the impacts of, of development. Again, the intent is not to um, is to, not to prevent or prohibit development, but to make sure um, it's appropriate. So that's my long answer to your short question. I guess. What, what I would add to that, Chris, is that so the Conservation Commission did talk with us you know, really wanting to kind of push the envelope a little bit more on whatever the, the regulations or whatever might be in the Shootsville Hill area. And um, they mentioned that they have been doing some work with individual landowners, you know, part of what Steve was just talking about. Um, they, they really wanted to see that to be advanced more. Our, uh, the Planning Commission, our take on it was that that was all great that they were doing that, but what hadn't taken place was some sort of um, kind of a, a town sanctioned planning process that would include public hearings that would give that process a, a much greater degree of legitimacy, number one. And then the other is that um, it's great when you're having conversations with people that are like-minded and predisposed 
perhaps to um, want to work together with the town. As I'm sure you know, when you have a public hearing, um, it's not always folks like that that, that are going to show up. And so there may be other people that may have very different ideas. And they need to be given an opportunity to participate and an opportunity to raise whatever their concerns are before we as a town you know, take any kind of official action, whether it's to you know, uh, articulate um, additional goals within the town plan or a, a greater concern would be to enact any legislation, uh, you know, regulations, I guess I should say. So, so that was the intent of our, and the, the gist of our conversation, which is that um, uh, it, we would look at there being some sort of an action item where we could have uh, a town officially sanctioned town process to have all those kind of discussions before we as a planning commission would come forward to you with, with a set of recommendations for you, know, for you to potentially take some action. So yeah. um, it was, uh, I would call it um, sort of a small step forward, but an important one because of the, the process implications of it. Unfortunately, probably the, real, the only real solution for a situation as delicate as this is uh, having the, the financial affordability to perhaps purchase the land and keep it as a, you know, either piece of town-owned land and conserve that, that uh, corridor. Uh, well, Chris, I think for private landowners who have an interest have a very, uh, they're, they're often the ones who are in the best position to um, be stewards of the land. That, um, you know, certainly we as a town, we have the waterworks property that um, you know, is managed by the, the EFUD commissioners but uh, are overseen. But I think, um, I think that's really been the goal of the Conservation Commission. I think the role of this plan is more, you know, how we map and how we potentially regulate these areas. And I think uh, we took the first step by having this forest resources map, which does identify the uh, forest connectivity blocks in the Shootsville Hill uh, area is, is one of those areas. This is a, this is a uh, came from state mapping. So, so I think um, that's really the, the role of the town is to support efforts uh, and to do what's um, reasonable and agreed upon as far as um, any anything on the regulatory side through zoning and subdivision. Does anybody else have any comments? Dan? Get up to the mic. Just two things. Um, I have draft number two, so you may have caught this, but um, under housing of 5.4, the last paragraph. Um, you say there are currently two residential care homes, and you mentioned the Squire House, and the Squire House is, for all intents and purposes, closed down. Okay. And it was, what is it called now, the Maple? Maple. Yeah, Maple yeah. Wood. Maple, Maple Hill. Wood. Maple Hill. Maple Hill. Maple Hill. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, Vermont is in the top ten of um, carbon sinks of all the states. We have more greenery for, as a carbon sink than uh, most of the rest of the nation. So I don't think we have to worry. Well, we don't live in a bubble. That's beside your point. You know, while the topic is about Shootsville Hill, um, I got a notice that the Green, at the Green Mountain Club a week from Thursday on the 12th, is going to be Tom Rogers, who's from, I think, the Stowe Conservation Commission. He works for the Agency of Natural Resources, too. Uh, it's, they're going to be talking about climate change and impact on the forest, as well as Shootsville Hill. That's the so that's at 7 p.m. on the 12th? 13th. 13th. Thank you. Thursday. Thursday. It is on Thursday. It's a week from Thursday. Where is it again? Jane? At the Green Mountain Club. Oh, yeah. And it's free. I'm sure they'll be accepting some donations, but it's free. What time now? 7 p.m. I can forward the uh, announcement. Thank 
came from the Conservation Commission. Anybody else have anything to say? Yeah, do you have a page? A page 41. for that 41? Okay. Are you looking for public commentary or are you just sure. for select one? Yep, public okay. as well. 5.4 slash paragraph under housing. So um, <coughs> I'll, I'll get with you yeah, afterward. Just yeah. Um, you all set? Hang on just a second. Go ahead. Good. Okay. You right, so uh, state your I'm name Anderson, first. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'm Glenn yeah. Anderson. I live up on Sweet Hill. Yep. Um, I'm on college from the trailhead about how they're um, I'm also a neighbor with Debbie uh, Moldy, who's down the road, and she asked me to just present some of her thoughts on this panel. Could you speak close? Sure. To Debbie Moldy, uh, my neighbor. You can look at that and just speak clo close to the To the microphone, microphone. yeah, sure. So, so Debbie has asked me to forward her. Uh, thoughts on this and first off I think you captured this was to essentially take the village language out of all of the records uh, as far as referring to the former Waterbury village as it relates to H716 having passed. Uh, my suggestion might be like downtown as to the village. Um, also, when speaking about the leash laws, she mentioned the incongruity of uh, owner versus guardian. I guess this is a political debate, so um, there's no consistency there in the report, so maybe just something like pet stewards, I don't know. Um, and then she also had issues with the wildlife corridor shift, so specifically with the Shootsville Hill, and that's something that you know I'll address as well. But um, yeah, we're in the Vermont Supreme Court right now dealing with the hunger ravines. And this is something that's frustrating for me. Um, so that was her stuff, and it all sort of added to that same quarter thing. So when we talk about the Shoots Hill Hill, you know, I'm in that. And uh, these plans basically dissect my property. Um, and the maps do that over and over and over again. So there's a narrative that just keeps being presented that this is what this quarter is. And I think there's a lot of people that are looking to these experts um, in the wildlife community. And there's a lot of social validation happening. And at the same point, these ideas are not really consistent with what we see in the Hunger of Beings and what we see in the actual Shoots Hill Corridor. So if you talk to some of the old-time hunters in that area, this corridor that's being mapped out is actually not correct. And it actually includes the Hunger of Beings. And so, I mean, it's frustrating because we watch the southern hunger ravines get developed, and here we have, you know, basically this, this push to control the water, the units of economics. And, you know, at a certain point, I'm now living next to two corporate global powerhouses in Unilever and Curry Dr. Pepper. And these are people that are being serviced by a holding company, a water company, that was created to service this village, yes, but now this non functioning village is basically defunct, right? So what is happening? The wildlife corridor is changing. When I moved in in 1994, there were moose walking through my backyard every day. Well, maybe not every day, but it was very consistent. Now there's none. And when you look at what happens with the water extraction coming out on the west side of the Waterworks Road and being piped out to the Waterworks, it's not sustainable. And I know we worked on getting the data. I do look forward to checking out the water data and the, you know, seeing what is being consumed, where, how it's commercially being used versus how it's being used for the public. I look forward to working with the town and figuring out a way to make that sustainable. But as a local neighbor, sitting next to these for-profit enterprises, working through this for-profit water company, I'm now saddled with having to fight to actually keep a corridor intact. And so we're in the Supreme Court challenging a subdivision that's meant to make it seem like it's just all subdivision you know, residential housing in an area that's not. It's a wildlife corridor. And I've been a steward in this space, as has Debbie, but he's not going to be that way if we keep pushing through. So I never was contacted by the Planning Commission, and I would have liked to have been, as a, as, a, as a landowner, I'd like to get more involved with planning, but at the same point, you know, I have a list here that I feel like nobody wants to really listen to. You know, I mean, it's very clear that this draft has been basically all set. It's going to be rubber stamped. The select board's going to say yes, and then we're going to put it to the town, you know, March vote. And like, what, we're going to rubber stamp something that's going to impact a whole lot of people? I mean, I read through every bit of that document. And I looked at pieces like, you know, for instance, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but the energy plan itself, it's basically saying anything that happens in the Shootsville corridor 
is going to be basically impacted in such a way that even though my neighbors to my south, the former village, were able to put in a 1.1 megawatt solar facility, now what, we're not allowed to? Because we're in this corridor? But at the same point, we're then forced with more development and not to mention you know, 80 cars on average every day of the summer. On the weekends, maybe on the you know, weekdays, definitely over vacations. I mean, it's just, it's a madhouse up there now. And when I moved in, there was maybe three cars on a July 4th weekend. And it's really frustrating, because I don't want to be the sort of lone wolf, the person that's like ostracized into having to protect these resources. But this is one of our most important recreational resources in the town of Waterbury. Now, hunger is a significant resource in the Humber Ravines. If any of you walked up there, and you know, I know some of you are on the DRB committee that oversaw that, and if you actually walked up there and saw the actual natural resources, you would understand how important it is to save this, this space. But more, you know, I mean, I could, I could go through the list or I could submit it by writing, but I mean, it's, it's one of those things where as I keep going through it, I got you know, so many specific questions. Things like, uh, you know, we want to give the DRB more oversight. What is the rejection rate of DRB proposals to date? I mean, is everything just going through, or are we actually seeing some pushback on stuff? And that's an important thing, because not everything should be developed. And we've, you know, what we have right now is 200 jobs leaving this community from current Green Mountain leaving. And this is real. These are people's lives and jobs at stake right before the holidays. So I'm trying whatever I can do to try to take our water rights and to create our product. And I want to make sure that we're able to help this community grow. But I feel at all turn, everyone is like trying to push back and like reject our rights. And they want to monopolize. See, if you go back to the 2013 town plan, I mean, effectively, the VNRC came in and said that, you know, the water effectively is going to be monopolized. So that only one group of users on this village-owned land can utilize that water for agricultural purposes and extraction. I mean, it's, it's basically taking Debbie and I and shutting us out the door and saying, no, you have no rights. And she's lived there since 19, what, 66? So th those are some points that I just wanted to like, bring the gravitas to the table here. Because just to rubber stamp what's going forward is not OK with me. And I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and reach out. I spoke to the lieutenant governor today. I reached out to him. I spoke to another individual that's interested in bringing maybe a few tens of millions of dollars to this area. So I'm doing my best to try to create economic growth through this area. But at the same point, I feel like you know, there's this plan that's just getting rubber stamped and rushed through this process. Um, one thing I really want to state for the record is the wind farms. And the, the whole idea that industrial wind should even be part of this is disgusting to me. I'm sorry, but like this ridge line, we should have a moratorium at 1,200 feet, and that's it. I mean, enough. Like, this ridge line's getting parceled out and parceled out. And every you now I drive down Loomis Hill now, going up the hill, and I'm looking at all these lights in the upper regions. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this wasn't long ago when it used to I look up there and I'd say, this is a really great place to live. Because it's got a beautiful backcountry. And I know I have a lot of neighbors that play in the backcountry all around the world. And you guys probably know them too. And this is a really cherished place. And we should not be just letting that development just climb up that ridge line. So that's, that's an important piece. I think all mentions of you know, wind packages, like anything over 1,200 feet, I think is just out of the question. I think, why are we even thinking that? Especially industrial scale. I mean, maybe community scale, if it's properly cited and goes through DRB oversight. But geez, let's not start baking in things that all of a sudden open the door for massive fights down the road so that we can, what, look at more towers after everybody in the survey is saying they don't want to see stuff on the ridge. I'm sorry, I just I think that's something that needs to be part of this. And you know, if I I can submit this, I don't want to run over time, but you know, if you want it in writing, I'm happy to. But you know, a few other points that you know I wanted to make were we we just experienced this downsizing of the current R and D factory, and we know that what's coming next for the production plan is probably very real. And yet we're still talking about, you know, a twenty million dollar bond vote for a school in a district that like what's gonna happen? We're gonna see so much gentrification in this community. So many people that have lost their jobs that are not going to be able to like, throw down and make their, their bills. So I just want to see those things addressed. I want to slow the wheels a little bit on this plan. I don't want to necessarily rush to ratify it. But you know, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves, like I said, and, and help out. Um, but I don't feel like people are asking. I mean, my former, you know, what, I, what I've done for a living is market research. I was retained by the brand group at Curry. That's when I realized just how exploitative behavior was. 
and it is to this day. So I'm trying to change things from within. When I get stiff arm, I'm going to just do what I have to do. But at the same point, when I look at the survey methodology, I mean, there's there's what 146 apparently like responses measured, but when you break it down, it's like 82 people that answered. But because of the way in which the random sampling is measured and you know aggregated with the general responses average, so there's like a lot of problems with the process that I could have helped with along the way. And I'm looking at this data and saying there's no statistical significance to like really truly base it off of anything you know to represent this community of 5,000. Um, you know, some of the other pieces, you know, I just, I guess, I don't know, I, I think there's going to, people are going to be able to read this in the transcripts or see this, and, you know, I just want to remind people that I'm literally living next to the impact of Unilever and Dr. Pepper Curry, or Curry Dr. Pepper. But remember, there's no Green Mountain coffee on that letter anymore. All right? So this is, like, massively impacting me, and when those headwaters get drained out and the what, class two wetlands dry up, the animals, the wildlife, are, you know, coming onto our property. So we have a couple of choices. A, we can eat. we can address our concerns up in the Humber Ravines, and we can try to incorporate that into this town plan. You know, or I'm going to be forced into a position, and it ties into a lot of the things and the reasons why I'm in the Supreme Court now, where we will have to take legal action. Could you explain what the impact that you're talking about is? This water, water, the water, water has to be depleted. Yeah, I just don't understand yeah, absolutely. what you're referring to. Well, so is that the basis of this lawsuit? Well, so, uh, okay, so let me backtrack. So basically, you know, the water extraction that happens on the Lewis land, right? And that water is piped to a water plant, and that's treated, and I think just the other day there's a big chlorine flush. And, you know, everybody that has what, piped water now knows that they're on that town service because, well, they filled the chlorine flush. And so that water gets extracted, and then what ends up happening is like for all of this summer, and I know it was a drought here, but this isn't just this year, this is every year, year after year after year. When the water's extracted, and basically it was from mid-July to mid-October, there was no running surface water. And so when that happens consistently, it basically dries up the class two wetlands on the other side of the road. And in doing that, too long and too long, you basically destroy all aquatic habitat. And that will shift the corridor without question. So what we're in the, you know, basically in a conversation about is the fact that, well, we've had the impact of that quarter shifting into our backyards. And so as a result, we're trying to protect this land that has a quarter on it that abuts to a very um, well-recognized agency of natural resource, mast um, beach uh, stand. And beach nuts form the habitat, the food source of bears and wildcats, and we have plenty of those. We see links come through their bobcat. Um, no more moose anymore, we have plenty of fox, lots of deer. And it's a corridor that if you look at the maps, uh, where is it? It's not, uh, let's listen for a second here. One of the maps, I think it's like 14, well, okay, so, is it the forest connectivity map? No, it's the northern boundaries, uh, one, town map 1-5 and town map 1-6. So on town map 1-5 is the water center village, um, which I think, you know, that needs to be labeled. I think that conversation is a whole separate conversation. Uh, but it's in that 1-6 where you can see, you know, basically our boundaries are clipped right in that. And, um, you know, there's another piece that, like, I look in, I look with, like, things that I'm finding on page 134 of the forest fragmentation. Basically, we're talking about downgrading all of class four roads to a trail, you know, wherever possible. Like, is that going to mean that that back road that now gets gated in the wintertime so that, you know, all of us that live up there that are dependent on that to get through the snow, we now don't have that half of the time of the year. And a lot of people that work in Waterbury um, and travel into snows, for instance, snowplowers, need to keep that open because they need to get to those places so that they can like not have to go all the way down and around. But you know what? Like Nobody seems to care. I mean, I've seen a man live his life petitioning both the towns of Waterbury and Stowe. And he went to make sure that that was kept open every year. And he had to fight for that. And that man didn't make a lot of money. But damn, you know, he was so gentrified by this community. And it's frustrating to see. Now, I can live at the end of a dead-end road and, and be more happy. 
Excuse but me, like, I think that's, that's a question. show. Excuse me, that's a show issue. It's not a library issue. Well, I guess then in this plan, we could then maybe strip that out and say that that can maybe be upgraded to a class three room. No, it's not. It's a show issue. Well, it is and it isn't. Because it is on their property, and I understand what you're saying. I went to the Stowe Select Board as well, and I met with them, and I had to petition them to keep it open. But they said, well, we have no resistance from Waterbury, so we're not going to listen to you. So if you maybe listen to me and stuff you know, with us and advocated for us, then maybe we could get Stowe to go on board with us and get Charlie to say, yeah, we'll keep it open, right? Because well, we have we need to Excuse me, me. Excuse me. Yeah. I think we need to focus on the plan. Well, okay, and so that's, this, is, this is the general statement. I just so want to let, me, let me say one thing here before you go any further. Um, I understand your concerns, and I have sympathy for what you're talking about. Um, you know, the problem with society is we want our cake and eat it too. And there's, you know, to, to get into the weeds of this thing would take all, literally all night. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that everybody out there is ignoring what's taking place. And you're right, to some degree, the people that are looking to speak out hard against issues that most people either ignore, they, you know, go through daily lives and don't pay attention to it. Uh, I mean, I've been here, I'll be 59 here in a few days, uh, been here forever since I was born. And the changes that I've seen have frustrated, through, frustrated me through my entire life. Uh, but there's so much complication to the whole system that's put us to where we are now that to solve it in you know, 15 minutes is right, going to be impossible. And I'm happy to submit right, for, for that reason. Yeah, but so at the same point, I want to be heard. Right? We need, right, so we need to, but we do need to limit the time frame of the discussion. You know, we were already over. So I don't want to like, step back and submit in writing, but at the same point, I would like to invite the committee to come up to the ravines um, to sit with Debbie and I and to talk to us because, you know, for a town of our size, that should be something that a resident that's been here since 1966. You know, she lives alone, um, and she deserves that respect. So, you know, I hope that that can come of this conversation, and maybe we can be human about this and find a better path forward. Bill, you've got something this, Can I ask right. a question? Is this the first time you've expressed these views, or have you met with them? No, he's been here commission before. I've been, I was here at the last public hearing, and, you know, I mean, I'm definitely involved in trying to advocate for a number of people. Go ahead, Bill. So, um, I just want to uh, make Three, three points. Um, and Glenn, I don't know when you, when you said that you weren't invited, um, the Planning Commission started this process months ago. It's been advertised generally. Uh, we don't send invitations to every resident of the town to come to these meetings. So the Planning Commission has held many, many meetings for many, many months, and maybe you've been to some of them, maybe you haven't been to any of them. Um, the select board, this is the second public hearing, and I just want you to be, I, I just want to be clear with you because you said uh, a couple things that concern me. One, um, the, the water company is not a for-profit company. It is a Vermont municipality, it's a municipal corporation. The village dissolved and a new municipality took its place. It is owned by the same people that owned it before. It is a public entity with elected commissioners, uh, and it's not for profit. It, it's, a, it's a municipal entity. So that's the first just correction. The second thing that you said that I want you to be I'm to sorry, hear tonight, the second thing. Age 716 or before? Age 716 is what made it into the municipal. Yeah, so it, it was one place. municipality, the village of Waterbury, that dissolved, and a new municipality, the Edward Farrar Utility District, <coughs> took its place. It is a municipal corporation. It was is that not done by merger? Oh, no, that's right. It's done by legislative action. It was done by the village voters who said, we want no, our... We identified in H716. That's what passed can, that. Can you... I've got the... I've got we the floor. There, weren't we? Can you just listen, Glenn? Yeah, Please? I'm listening. Completely. Okay, then keep your mouth closed while I talk. That's listening, okay? The village voters amended their charter. And the Vermont state law says a municipality cannot amend its charter unless the legislature ratifies it. So the village municipal government said, we don't want to be this anymore. They gave up their general government functions and said, we want to be this. 
and they have the responsibility to have a water and sewer system. It is still a municipal government, and the legislature ratified the charter of the village of Waterbury, just like they did in 1894 when the village first voted to become a village. So I'm just letting people know it's not a, pro a for-profit water company. The second thing that I would like you to understand is <clears throat> the select board doesn't have to take action tonight. It's their decision to decide upon, after they close the public hearing, what, whether they want to vote on this, whether they want to send it back to the Planning Commission. But you suggested in your statements that in March, we the voters would ratify this. And that is not the process. The process for the town plan is the Planning Commission generates a plan, submits it to the select board, and then the select board can adopt the plan. It does not require voter approval. If you don't like it after the select board approves it, there's an, a, there is a, a, a process by which you can, you can bring it to the town voters to reject it. But I just want you to be clear that it, it does not go from here to town meeting. No, I do understand that. OK. Well, you said it's going to be ratified in March. And, and it's not going to be ratified in March. Well, I mean, there would be other sequences. But I mean, the, no. the, the, the whole point of what I'm trying to establish here is that like, if you look at the water that comes mm -hmm. out of that basin, we're talking about something that dictates a whole lot of monetary flow. Now, we could lie about that or pretend that that doesn't exist, but there's a number of businesses. No, I don't think it's related to this, but it plan. does. I'm it absolutely about. does. No, you don't want to hear it, but I'm saying, no, right? like, when you I look at the town plan, does it not talk about water and the town resources of water? My, my point wasn't to argue with plan. you about the water. You, you have your opinions about the water, and that's fine, and I don't disagree with you. I just want you to understand my comments were simply that it's not a for-profit water company, and the, pr the, process, sure. the process is the select board gets to adopt the town plan. It doesn't have to be ratified by the voters. And to which I would add to the select board, if that would be something that you fast track a vote on this and pass it without due process, of course we're going to bring this back to the public for rejection. Well, can I, I mean, no, for, excuse me, this cannot be appealed to the town voters. There can be a vote of the town voters that they, the town voters, adopt the plan. That has not happened in Waterbury. To my knowledge, there is no appeal that I'm aware of. And can you correct me? I think you have to get a petition of, uh, I'm going to be wrong on the percent. No. I want to say it's like 15% of the voters, there's a very small window of opportunity that that appeal would have to be. But So there is a potential yeah. avenue of appeal. It's not necessarily an easy one for somebody to do. But if you get 15% of the voters to sign a petition in the amount of time that's allotted by state law, then, then yeah, then, that, then it could be. It's appeal. basically a rescind process. In a sense, I, you know, I think we should we have look to look into that. Statute. We would have to look okay. at that. Well, then so, I just finish up and I'll leave yeah. it to be. Right. So I would say this. I would say that since this merger, not merger, since this town has become a non-village entity through H716, I think instead of rushing to use that process they would like you to use to ratify this plan and just make it happen, I think it's upon the select board to put this back to the people, make sure that this is done right. And then say, how does this really move forward? If we're really going to truly merge, I mean, quite frankly, I voted for the merger back when the two previous ago. And then I voted for the rescinding of it. And you know why? Because the water district is treating everything separate but equal. I mean, separate but unequal. I mean, if you look at it, the fundamental core of what that water district does, it generates property values that are increased for certain people and decreased for others. That's not right. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Gwen. Is there anybody else that has any comments on this particular item? On the select board? Okay. It looks like that we can uh, officially close out the hearing then on the uh, third draft of the municipal plan. And uh, that's, that's fine. I yeah. think, in all due respect, we have. Um, the current missile plan is due to expire on December 9th. Um, the Planning Commission has followed the public process. You've followed the public process. Uh, we have 
Uh, I think the Planning Commission has made a huge effort to incorporate public comment into the plan. Um, I would encourage you to adopt this draft um, this evening so that we don't face having a, a plan that has expired. I think that's important, and we've talked about that. Um, I think uh, there's been a public process. Uh, we can look into the statutory requirements if you're interested in that. I can get, I can print it off in my office, um, and I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have in my memory exactly what the process is, but the town is not elected to have a town vote on the plan. Um, it's, it's your prerogative to uh, adopt the plan as, um, as it moves through the process. And it can be amended in the future. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to note the two things that Steve, one he just said, and then one he said about 20 minutes ago, is that um, we need to have a town plan that's effective, and this will, our current plan will expire. December 9th. So uh, if we, if you don't take an action to approve the plan, then we'll have an expired plan, and there are consequences that go along with that. Um, the other point is, and I'm not suggesting that <coughs> if Mr. If you approve it and Mr. Anderson decides he wants to appeal it, that he shouldn't, but what I would remind you all of is that simply adopting this plan doesn't mean it has to stay in place for eight years. If there are concerns that arise in the interim, you can ask the Planning Commission to go back and, and you know fix something again. I think that is, uh, uh, I don't think that's, I hope that's not necessary in the, in the near term, but um, it is much more expedient to have a plan in place uh, as opposed to an expired plan, and if there are issues, you can you can revisit the concerns that you have. Um, I, I guess I, I would ask this: Would that be a more appropriate time or process for perhaps Glenn's concerns? Uh, would what be a more appropriate process to, to uh, <clears throat> possibly look at amending some of this in the, the four-year time frame or? Well, that, that, that's, that's, that's up to the select board, um, I think. Right, the, but the, I'm saying if he has concerns to bring it to the table at the 11th hour, basically uh, here tonight, um, it's difficult for us to just put a brick wall in front of the, in front of the train that's running and, and bring it to a complete stop. Well, I think there's, I don't think there's any way to resolve the issues that That's he raised saying. tonight before December 9th. It's December 3rd now. You're not going to be able to address any of those issues. So there's future right opportunity for him to... I mean, he can yes, ask you to, he can ask you to put on the agenda. You know, he can come in and ask you to talk about some things if he wants to make presentations. And then once, once that conversation is had, if the select board feels that well, we should reopen something or revisit something. You you can do that, and you can consult with the planning commission about what their feelings are and what that process would be. But to to not approve this and allow the plan to expire, I think, would be detrimental to the community. From uh, previous testimony, uh, the the plan does not have enforceable aspects to it. It's an inventory of resources within the community and a statement of uh, proper intent uh, going forward for uh, future development, but there are other uh, entities within the community that deal with that. The Zoning Commission establishes um, uh, what can be done within certain tracts of lands, the Development oh. Review Board, is there in place. So this is basically a, a guidance yeah, it's, document. It's a, it's a guidance document. Um, and again, I'm not expert enough to, to know what happens. I believe if the plan expires, your current zoning will stay in place. But you can't amend the zoning bylaw if you don't have a, a, an adopted a town plan. plan. Yeah. So there are things that, you know, the Planning Commission is the same entity that creates the zoning bylaws, and they've been looking at the zoning bylaws for 
for quite some time. In fact, they were they were working on and you know some amendments to the zoning bylaw, and they put that on the back burner so that they could get the town plan adopted before it expired. And I would imagine at some point they're planning to go back to the zoning bylaws. So the bylaws would not be able to be amended if you didn't have a plan in place. That is what enables zoning bylaws. Mm -hmm. my, my sense from Mr. Anderson's comments is that uh, uh, zoning related activities are probably a more appropriate venue for, for trying to address the particular issues there and that this just provides that overarching architecture for that process to take place. Is that a fair? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for Glenn. I don't want to speak for Glenn, um, but yes, you can, you can more specifically speak to the development of particular zoning districts mm -hmm. through amendment to the zoning bylaw and and making changes there. The plan, as you said, is kind of a, a broad uh, document that that points that shows the direction the town would like to move into. Now hang on just a second, Glenn. I uh, want everybody to have a chance to speak, so Barb, you can go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm far, far. You need to talk in the mic. There. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, the plan is a bit more than just guidance. It's also the requirement, if you're applying for any grants that are out there, do you have an effective plan in place, an adopted plan? So for transportation projects, any community development projects, um, historic preservation projects all require a plan. Um, and also when you're undergoing, any projects undergoing Act 250 review, we'll look towards the plan for um, what the guidance is for moving forward with any projects on land use. So it's not just, it is guidance, but it's more than that. It's a requirement if you're going to be taking the next step for any either funding or Act 250. Thank you. Okay, two seconds, Glenn, and we're way yeah, on the time. Think, I think, you know, it is putting words in my mouth. I think I would say that it's not worth passing this tonight. Um, I think, you know, regardless of grants that might be passed uh, or presented within that time period between the 3rd and the 9th or whatever, we resolve a new plan that addresses these issues. I mean, I think there's, there's a concern that it sets a tone um, for what is permissible development, uh, permissible uh, infrastructure. It sets a tone for what the Shootsville Hill actually is. And we can test that. We're in the courts right now contesting that. So to rush this into passage right now, I think it is disrespectful to the process. And I think it's not just my voice. There's a number of people that are you know, at stake here. So I think part of this problem that I have is that there's been, you know, if you look at the UDAC loans and you look at the village development and the disappear of the village, you have a whole lot of investment into businesses that benefited from this water. And at the end of the day, when this water is not sustainable, we have to address that. And I have ideas in mind. That's why I got the data for the water, right? for the water and sewage data. But I think there are ways that we can create a better water product and have more sustainability. And I think that can incorporate into this plan. I'm willing to do that, but not if we rush through this and fast track this. If that happens, then the question I put back on you is who has the liability for the words that are created from this document? Because I know in, two, in 2013, VNRC said that there's going to be a use of land zoning to a municipal zoning to allocate to uh, to restrict the use of water and the extraction of water and essentially create a monopoly. So those words have liability and consequence. And anything that goes into a ratification state, anything that you pass that becomes a town document, represents intention and significance, right? So now we're sitting in a space where if my uh, recourse is simply to say, look, you're all screwing me by putting me next to this big, massive water empire of people that are working in the billions of dollars, people. I don't want to have to be put in that position where I have to sue the town I live in and file motions of harassment. So I'm going to leave it at that. I respectfully ask the select board to take your time. We can figure this out. Any grants that may be coming up, probably, with all due respect, maybe should be put on hold as well. Because we are rushing to develop and rushing to implement this plan, and it's backfiring. And we've seen jobs lost over and over and over again. And I'm not willing to rush into something just so that we can, like, what, run for more $2,000, $3,000 grants? Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, Glenn. 
So I guess it's the board's decision as to whether or not uh, you wish to approve this tonight. And uh, if so, then uh, take a motion to uh, approve the final third and final draft of the updated municipal plan um, as presented. There would be a motion to adopt the plan. All right, I will make the motion to adopt uh, the plan as represented in draft number three, dated November 5th, 2018. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. A motion's been made and seconded to approve the uh, municipal plan as presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Very good, Steve. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I think you'll have other opportunities to prove your point. In, uh, Do you think it's all about proving your point, Chris? No, I, I, I know where you're coming from, Glenn. Okay, we could have a personal conversation outside of a meeting at some point in time. Uh, I think this is like one of the most egregious things the select board could have done. I mean, I think that the amount of manipulation that has gone into people's lives to tear their lives apart. No, you don't understand, though. No. It's real. Don't trust. No, it's you're so Seriously, Glenn. It's so, so ridiculous. No, no time to take this up here now. Um, my number's in the book. You're welcome to call me anytime. Okay. Um, so, I guess we'll begin the... Uh, select board meeting, but before we do so for December 3rd, 2018, I want to thank Mark for kind of overseeing things here while I was gone on vacation. Um, and I appreciate it. So uh, moving forward, uh, take a motion to approve the agenda as presented, uh, unless there's any changes or additions. Hearing none, seeing none, uh, motion to approve. Make a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, no further discussion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Consent agenda is the next item on the agenda. The minutes from November 19th meeting and a liquor license and outside consumption permit for Pegasus LLC. Uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make the motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Okay. Second. I'll second that. Uh, any further discussion? I have one. I don't know if my mic's working. Is it green? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I keep turning on, but. Bill, do you, do you know the details on why the DLC is requiring them to get two licenses? I don't. Okay. I just thought that was odd that they were now requiring that when they weren't previously requiring that. Just the complicate. I know, understand the complications that could be created behind that, and I don't know if we need to say anything against it. But it was. I mean, I just happened to be standing there when he came in and handed it to Carla, and he just said, "Well, they consider it two locations." So whether, whether you know, when Chad built the the uh, place in the back. Uh, if you didn't ask, I, I don't know. So. Yeah. Okay. That's all, I all right. So there's been a motion and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, say aye. 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 She gave better. Public. The public has a chance to speak uh, at this moment. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to make any comments? I guess not. So we'll move forward, 7.38, we're a little behind, but discussion on Vorak Grant Fields and Facilities. We're back. Yes. <laughs> Is there an agenda that I can take a look at this? Yeah. I start getting involved right now. You can subscribe online, here's the agenda. So, shall we go ahead and jump Sure. Go okay, right ahead. What do you got for us? Absolutely. So, uh, in your last meeting, uh, Nick and I presented a, uh, a proposed grant application, and this is to the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Collaborative. 
uh, commonly referred to as uh, the GORAC. It was an initiative of um, Governor Scott to uh, build a uh, partnership or collaborative between uh, the state, uh, between nonprofit organizations such as the Green Mountain Club and um, the private uh, recreation sector, if you will. Um, Kingdom Trails up in Burke, uh, other um, uh, companies that sell recreation products. So they set up a grant program. Uh, it's a pilot. Uh, there's $100,000 available. And what they're saying is that they uh, would like to give either one or two grants to municipalities. Um, we're obviously eligible. Um, so we brought a project to you last time. Um, this is the same project that we're bringing back to you. So we have a little more detail. We have a more detailed budget. And um, the grant application is due December 14th. And um, so we, we'd like to just go through uh, the budget. There's a um, project description here. This will be part of the grant application. And there's also a project narrative on the back side that um, it, addresses how this will uh, achieve uh, VORECS vision for outdoor recreation friendly community. We see ourselves as an outdoor friendly uh, community, certainly. And uh, so this project is designed to enhance our existing facilities. And um, so we're uh, trying to make the case that there will be an economic benefit uh, to the town of Waterbury and its uh, citizens and to the business community as a result of this project. So um, there are basically um, six components to the project. Um, the uh, five of them are, are on the ground uh, improvements. Uh, and then the fifth is a planning project. And uh, we also have uh, Dana and Amanda are here representing the Waterbury Area Trails Alliance, commonly referred to as WADA. And uh, Alyssa here is here as well, and uh, she's been a partner in putting together this uh, project and drafting uh, the language. So I'd like to just go through this uh, fairly quickly um, with Nick's assistance and um, just remind you what the basic components are. We've refined the budget. Uh, in a nutshell, we're, we'd like to get authorization to apply for a $50,000 grant that we would be matched with uh, $14,600 in um, local cash match. Uh, WADA has offered uh, to, or at least will um, take to their membership the possibility of some fundraising, private fundraising, but it would be a modest amount, probably neighborhood maybe $2,500 would be a modest amount. Um, so we've gone over this with Bill in terms of um, budgeting. Some of these are projects that um, we, we need to do anyway, and some of them are what I would refer to as optional projects. So we'll try to uh, share with you how, how that breaks out. Uh, the first item is uh, trailhead and recreational wayfinding signage. This would be supplementary to the wayfinding signage and the kiosks that are part of the Main Street reconstruction project. They're actually uh, part of the contract that the uh, state of Vermont will be uh, establishing with, um, with the, the contractor for Main Street reconstruction. These would be uh, signs with maps that would help people orient to uh, two trails, the Cross Vermont Trail that um, goes from the end of Winooski Street to the back of the state complex, or that's a segment of the Cross Vermont Trail that's in Waterbury. And then the a community path, uh, so we want to try to boost uh, utilization of those paths. Then um, replacement of new park entrance signs. Uh, this is a project that uh, Nick has been working on for three of our parks. It would be a total of, of four signs. And then uh, would be a, a renovation and a resurfacing of the community path. Um, certain sections uh, have grown in the grass. There, um, some areas are, are poorly drained, so we want to resurface that path with a gravel base and crushed stone surfacing uh, to help utilization, uh, especially when it's used through the Fleet Creepers Half Marathon and the Gravel Grinder Race, which are very popular big economic drivers in our community. 
And then um, lighting fixture replacement for the, uh, the lights on the poles at Dacro, at the softball field, at uh, Anderson Field, tennis courts, and outdoor ice rink. That would be an energy efficiency project. And I'll turn this over to you, Nick, in a minute to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, pool building renovation for handicapped houses <coughs> and um, for a family uh, gender neutral um, bathroom and changing room. Uh, we've, uh, Downsize that a bit to a modest project that would uh, we feel would meet those requirements uh, that the state has established. And um, then the last project, uh, as I mentioned, is a project to take a, a further step to plan and lay the groundwork for the Waterbury uh, Village to Little River State Park Connector Trail, uh, working with landowners. Uh, to further defining a, a specific route for that trail, working with a trails um, uh, builder to um, establish uh, budgets and then uh, alignment for the segments that are on uh, existing trails and um, to uh, establish either easements or uh, agreements. Uh, this is a project that we would work closely with WADA on. They have a keen interest in seeing this project move forward. So Nick, do you want to add about the um, a little bit more about the energy efficiency project with the lights and uh, so on? Um, just that the lights need to be—it's what we talked about last time. Lights need to be replaced a lot more. Um, the new lights should just be more efficient, so it's like a win-win. Um, and the bathroom renovation again is what we talked about last time. Just adding another option so people can get to the pool, uh, change if they're in a family, it's handicap accessible. We would also uh, apply for a efficiency Vermont uh, rebate yep. that's been built into the budget um, that, that would help pay for the, um, the light fixtures. That may be a limited window on when those rebates are, are available. So this project would allow us to, uh, if we can get the grant, to move forward with the entire project. And then we would hire an electrician to rewire uh, those lights as, as needed. And then the pool building renovation, there'll need to be some electrical work. So we built a, built in a contingency there to do uh, electrical work in the pool building, make sure that any new, new wiring meets code and anything else that has to be brought up to code, such as the panel, would be taken care of at the same time. So real quick before I forget it, um, if there's an energy efficiency rebate, how does that offset doesn't. It's already doesn't. It's already in there. Okay. Yeah, it's factored in. We would have to uh, cover the cost up front. We'd work with Bill around budgeting. Right. But if you want to add the twenty-eight thousand, whatever that number yeah, is, already is net of the okay. of that rebate. <laughs> I was I was hoping to decrease that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we we factored that in. It's not an inexpensive project, right. obviously. No, I understand that you said that this is, <laughs> a lot of this was work we were going to end up being if, faced to if force to do it anyway. If we don't, if we don't, I mean, all of that can be done. I don't have it in front of me, but it's around 14,000 something local. Sure, extra copy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, if, if the grant is received, we can do all of that for $14,000 mm -hmm. local share. But if we don't get the grant, um, some of the lighting and the, the bathroom uh, stuff will have to be done. Anyway. <coughs> and then we'll have to. Um, so, you know, we're not going to, we probably will not know about whether we've received this grant before we do the budget. So I'm going to have to kind of have a contingency <laughs> budget and uh, and then if we get the grant we'll we'll do more. Okay. So do you need a motion? Yeah what we would ask is a motion to um, authorize um, Bill to sign a grant application and also to um, as part of the motion to uh, put uh, $14,600, approximately $14,600 in the budget uh, as a local cash match. Does that sound good, Bill? Yeah. And the application has to be in by? Uh, December 14th is the due date. So. I've got a question. 
and a comment. <clears throat> Are you going to include a map? Is there a, is there a process by which you add a little map here, showing where some of these things are? Yeah, well, we have, um, in addition to the description, we'll, we'll do, yes, there's uh, attachments that would include uh, maps, photographs. To be able so to we'll make, sure to do that. make the, that. the uh, case about the connectivity of these trails and the, yeah. okay, including, I think, that'd be one comment I'd have for, number, for your third item on your first page here about the community path. Okay. Because you, you went to a lot of description, and I totally agree. The um, It's inadequate, and it needs to be updated. It's time um, to do that, and it's, it's great. I totally support it, but I think you need to provide just one s sentence that it's what, about the critical link that it will provide between the, the village, an elementary school, and the center, and okay. an alternative to Route 100. Okay. Because it, it has a di very different role than the other connector trail you're talking about. Right. Well, maybe there is the. Uh, so it's really critical it gets upgraded. Right. The second. Because it's not being used the way it is. Right. The second sentence refers to that. Maybe we can okay. beef that up. Just beef that up a little. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay. What's the feeling on the grant getting approved? Um, we don't know. We don't know what the competition will be. It's a pilot program, so there are only going to be one or two grants. So um, it, it's hard to know. We're going to make the best case we can with Alyssa's help on the economic side. Um, it doesn't, doesn't ask for a match, but we're trying to be competitive by giving yeah. them. So. There's some questions that deal with uh, underserved populations, and you know we are a um, somewhat affluent. Um, Community, we're trying to make the case that we're vulnerable because of our experience with the state complex uh, being vacated largely after Tropical Storm Irene, and uh, knowing that Curie Green Mountain may uh, have further layoffs in Waterbury. So we're trying to make that case that we're uh, vulnerable, and this will help provide some buffer in the community. But we don't know is is the answer. But we'll is, is there a chance? Is there a chance that it could be partially funded, or is it an all or nothing? I don't know what they say in the guidance is that um, they're probably only going to give one or two grants. I think they what they want to do is they want to see a real strong impact in one or two communities. They, they have $100,000. $100,000 is it. So it's going to be either one $100,000 grant to a project they choose or maybe two fifty thousand. So we're, we're banking on it being one of the 50000 We certainly have a shot at it. Is there any role to talk about how uh, we have a lot of young families in our demographic at our school is, you know, we, we've been very fortunate because we have uh, full enrollment at our school, growing enrollments. So the rec, rec programs are really important to our town as like an economic factor to, to draw families here, keep yeah. people here. Yeah, we can definitely be yeah. well, It's really a big attraction in our, in our town, though, to have... You have to be careful about saying that, Jane. It, well, no, I'm not we, saying we you got, say it exactly. Full enrollment, and now okay, it can change. But I'm just—I'm not saying it that. I'm not, I, maybe you don't phrase it quite that way. But I think the point is that recreation is really important to our town, and we need to stay current or upgrade what we have because we have so many, uh, so popular and, and so many young families here. So maybe lay off the thing about the school. But you get my my you get my drift. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole set of criteria that we we we've been working on addressing and. I it just think that's a big selling issues, point. Like the rec program, the, yeah. um, the summer lunch program, that this helps support. It. It's all tied together. Thank you. Could I? You got to go to the, with the microphone. <laughs> please state your name, too, please. Uh, Dane Allen, I'm the president of the Waterbury Area Trails Alliance. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the trails and the connectivity piece um, in a little bit more detail. We've been working with Steve on this a little bit, and um, just to sort of let the select board know what's going on, there's an initiative right now that's being sort of spearheaded by a lot of small nonprofits. Vermont Mountain Bike Association is one. Um, the Vermont Huts Association is another. Vermont Backcountry Alliance is a third. Um, it's an initiative called the Velomont Trail. Um, so we're trying to link Killington to Stowe with a purpose-built uh, mountain bike and backcountry ski connector. Um, so mountain bike trail, multi-use trail, that sort of thing. Um, and eventually they're going to be adding huts in along this trail. 
So it's going to be a hut-to-hut -hut network, much like you'd see in like the White Mountains of New Hampshire or in some of the Alpine you know, regions of Europe, that sort of thing. So what we're trying to do, Waterbury sits right in the middle of this. We're kind of at the northern end. We've been working with Stowe Trails Partnership in Stowe for a couple of years now on figuring out a connector through Little River State Park. Um, and so what Water really wants to do is start to connect the village of Waterbury with Little River State Park um, and then eventually south towards Dowsville area um, and the Mad River Valley. So to contextualize this whole grant application, VOREC um, and the governor's initiative for this program kind of came out of this whole burgeoning mountain bike, backcountry skiing, outdoor recreation scene. Um, so that's a lot of the impetus there not to discount the traditional outdoor recreation that we're talking about. That's really important as well. Um, but this is the sort of thing, this, this Vailamont initiative has captured a lot of imagination and we have a very strategic part to play in this to connect into Little River State Park, to connect to Stowe, to connect south to the Matter River Valley. So this grant, if we get this money to improve the community path, to conduct additional planning on what's already been done um, to get you know, over the Blush Hill Corridor to Little River State Park is very, very important. I think that Waterbury has a very good shot um, at getting this grant uh, because of that strategic importance and because of this initiative. There's a lot of awareness at the state right now about Vailamont. Um, there's also a lot of private companies that are interested in this, like Cabot Cheese has put a lot of money into it um, or will be putting more money into it in the future. So just wanted to sort of put that out there um, because that's really why WADA's involved. We, you know, we love the community path. We love using it during the gravel grinder. Um, we promise to inform you guys of when the day is and not clog up the roads like we did last year. I'm sorry. Um, but we want to see the community path improved because that's going to also provide a great connector into any sort of corridor over Blush Hill into Little River State Park. So that's going to be really important for this whole Vailamont initiative. So just wanted to provide some context there um, and just kind of keep you uh, up to date on some of that stuff that's going on, which is pretty exciting right now. So. That's my piece. Do you have any Thank questions? Or? Okay. Uh, well, do you think that we should be going for more money for the whole 100000 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, seriously. I think, I think we can make a very good case for this budget. And Bill, maybe you have some comments, but I don't think so. Well, again, um, if you had wanted to do that, I would have asked you to say that when Steve came to the last meeting. Well, I hadn't because, heard about the Vailamont Well, case. yeah, but this application is due on the 14th of December, and to come up with $50,000 more of a project that we know that we can do, I don't think is possible right now, so. Yeah, and I think with the Vailamont initiative, uh, we're trying to lay the groundwork uh, for the trail and build it in steps, and we don't want to get ahead of ourselves because we're dealing with private landowners. They, uh, right now, we've got a group of private landowners that are, are supportive, and, but I think we have to build those relationships and set up the agreements and possible easements. But we'll, you know, you'll continue to be involved. Yeah, my comment on that would be, I think going for half of it and hoping that they pick two is a better odds. And if we can get all this done for $14,000 on our spend, we should give ourselves the best shot at getting the money. Yeah, we're trying to be reasonable about our task. <laughs> And the match. So moving forward is. Wait, oh, we sorry, I'll be very quick. Okay. I um, sorry, Amanda uh, from Wada. Um, to answer your question, the grant is looking for a lot of shovel-ready projects, and um, this will set us. This grant will set us up for the Valmont connector. But at this point, Valmont's not at the state where we can start really digging into the ground to make the trails. So I think this grant, what we're proposing, is really our best option, and it will open us up to more funding down the road for these connector trails. So, Great. thank you. Okay. So is there a desire from the board to uh, make a motion to authorize Bill to sign the VOREC grant and also put in a budget number of 14600 in uh, this year? following year's budget. Uh, I'll make a motion budget. to allow Bill to sign the grant uh, application, uh, as stated, including um, the local cash match of $14,600. I'll 
I'll second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? I got a question for you, Bill. Um, hypothetical question, perhaps, but nonetheless. Uh, push comes to shove. We have to uh, make some cuts in the budget. Um, if this 14,600 ends up going on the chopping block, does that also kill the rest of this grant? Well, as was said, uh, there's, no, there's no local match required by this grant. So you could apply for $50,000 without a local match. We think it's more competitive with a $14,600 match. Um, if we get to the point where you're thinking that you have to cut $14,600 out of the budget, um, it's going to be disappointing because there's a $15,000 bathroom renovation that needs to happen and a portion of that $28,500 uh, lighting uh, upgrade that needs to happen. So if we can't afford $14,600, we won't be able to do either one of those things. So I think let's see what the budget looks like before we worry about where we No, nope, it was just a hypothetical no, no, question. I'm, but I'm just yep. saying there's things on here that we're going to, if we don't get this grant, we'll be paying more than $14,000 for only a couple things on this list. All right. A motion's been made and seconded. Uh, unless there's any other discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Appreciate it. Arb. Arb. Um, so I'm here and on the agenda tonight to have you or ask you to approve the municipal policies and codes for the, um, uh, we received a grant from the Vermont Community Development Program for the feasibility study, to conduct a feasibility study for a community center. Um, we had asked for $45,000, they awarded us $35,000, and one of the, um, there are several stipulations before we actually receive the grant agreement from the organization um, to move forward with this, but one of them is to <clears throat> sign updated municipal policies and codes. I think Carlos sent everybody a copy of those over uh, from last Friday. Um, the, the town has had these in place for other prior grants from the community development program. Um, the, this is a new version and it includes a whistleblower um, clause at the very end of it, but it's basically things like uh, equal opportunity employment, fair housing policies, um, they're pretty standardized federal requirements, use of excessive force policy, which means don't use excessive force, uh, policy on use of, uh, for federal lobbying, lobbying, do not do, code of ethics, uh, drug-free workplace, um, monitoring for um, Subrecipient, subrecipient oversight and monitoring policy, make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, and then the whistleblower. So it's a formality. Um, there are a couple of other items that are required that will happen behind the scenes, <clears throat> but that's Steve's working on the uh, SAM.gov registration is one of them. Um, we need to fill out a form that says who's going to be doing what, and Steve and Nick are also part of this. Um, so as this project gets underway, you're really going to, the two of you are going to act as the leads, um, Steve primarily, uh, Nick, you're coming in under the wing here, um, to look at all of the different partners on this and a whole public um, uh, outreach on doing a feasibility study. So that's kind of where we are. So <clears throat> this is basically a boilerplate uh, document for uh, part of the grant acceptance process yes. of the grants been Everybody's awarded. Everybody's required. And does Bill need to have authorization to sign off on that? No. There's Carla has the policy, and each one of you would sign it. The select board does. Yes. This MP1 uh, requirements there, I read through it. Um, is that a complete new new version of the? Oh, the only new addition on that is Rags. the whistleblower policy at the end. It's the very last page. 
everybody receiving these federal funds is asked to update their policies. Do you have any questions on um, any policies in particular? Or? Oh, I had a couple of issues with some of the stuff that was in there, but um, I think I'm going to... Uh, stick with my consistency and this is on the community development uh, uh, center right this is on the the community uh yeah. so i'll be abstaining from it anyway okay. so it's not worth getting into the weeds on okay. that well so I, I should probably mention that and for those of you who, who aren't aware um, the issue has been well is it going to be a town-owned facility is it going to be a burden on the facility on the tax or on the municipality it's going to be a burden on the taxpayers um, this feasibility study as the we're going to be hiring out we have a, a draft RFP that is ready to go once we get the um, grant agreement in place but if there is no appetite for having this be a municipal organization, there the plan is to look at all other types of ownership possibilities, which could be nonprofit, it could be a public private, it could be a private, completely privately owned. So we don't know yet. So I'm just I just wanted to Right. And my objection isn't the fact that there's a desire to have this. Mm -hmm. My objection is that there's no guarantee that the taxpayers as a whole won't be on the hook for it. If that guarantee was there, then well, it might be more acceptable to it, you know? Yeah, today I can't guarantee, but I can Right, and it's not your, yes, strongly. absolutely. <laughs> that's um, gonna be evaluated along with everything else. Yeah. No, I, think, I understand that's part of the process. Is the RFP also looking to identify sites where this could exist or not? Um, the RFP, the way it's drafted right now, is not to go into detail with any particular sites. It's to do a kind of a first brush at um, what sites might be available. But really, the intent of the feasibility study is to look at who else is interested in being a partner in this. We know the senior center is, we know the children's room is, we know the recreation facilities need to be um, enhanced or changed. Uh, we know the school lunch program, or the um, lunch, summer lunch program that um, is looking for space. Um, so we're really looking at what is, who are the other groups that might want to be involved? How big should this facility be? What is a likely square footage? How much of the synergy can be obtained by different groups saying, okay, there's one commercial kitchen, but all these different user groups can use it for different purposes. I don't know. That, um, it's intended to be multi-generational and multi-facility. So, um, so I'll, I'll just, yeah. while we're talking about this, I'll convey you a little bit of a, what concerns me. Um, I attended a Harwood school budget me meeting the other night. Um, <clears throat> Michelle Baker is the bookkeeper, financial director, whatever you want to call her. She went through the budget very for the most part, fairly detailed. Um, I came out of it a little frustrated uh, watching what was taking place there through the night and uh, some of the lack of input as part of the budget process and some of the discussion about possibly cutting minor costs in areas that could be cut, whatever. But what I came away with was uh, on a $37 million budget for Harwood, Duxbury, Waterbury, Moortown, Waitsfield, Warren, Faston, we are $9 million over the statewide average per pupil spending, just in, in uh, this district alone. Um, out of the $37 million budget, 28 million, over 28 million dollars of that was just paying teachers and staff. Uh, just the, just the, the idea of being nine million dollars over the statewide average per pupil spending was hard to take. You know, what got us there uh, and, and why? And now they're asking for another 15 million dollar proposal to uh, for cost to renovate Harwood. Um, 
you know, the budget right now. Yeah. Yeah. So you understand, I, I'm, it isn't just what takes place here tonight that affects my attitude about cost of property taxes and the cost of living in not only just the town, but the state as a whole. Um, you know, Glenn was talking about Keurig and these guys pulling out of here. And, you know, there's reasons for that. And uh, I just hope we're not making, making bigger problems for ourselves. So um, moving forward, uh, there's a desire from the board to uh, approve this. Um, he wants to make the motion. What, what is that motion? Uh, the motion to, to accept the MP1. Adopt, uh, adopt the um, MP1 uh, requirements for community center feasibility study grant. Excuse me, I think it's the codes that you're. It's the, well, it's the same thing. It's the municipal uh, policies and codes, which yes. is for MP1, but it's not specific to just this feasibility study. If once the town adopts these new ones with the whistleblower language, they we wouldn't are, have to do it for another grant. We will not need to do it for another grant unless they make another change. Right, but they're they're not just policies for the grant. They're policies. Right. So that becomes the yeah. town policy, mm -hmm. ethics policy. Yeah. Um, and these so are the, the motion place. is the acceptance of this for the town. Right. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. So the th the difference between the thirty five thousand dollar funding that's available versus the 45000 that we had requested in terms of sh shaving some off in terms of um, the scope of work. It's, you don't feel that it's significant in terms of impacting what the outcome will be or um, what's, what would change? Uh, well, I think the scope may it's change. $10,000 less. Yeah. When, we ha when we were applying for this grant, we asked a local company who does this sort of work to just give us a ballpark number of what might be expected or anticipated for a cost of a feasibility study. And the response came back $50,000. Now that's a, we can tweak that, but that's pretty much a number of, you know, pulled out of here, this is about what it's gonna cost you. So with this funding and the cash match that we have for, it brings the 35 plus another 6,250, brings it up to a 41,000 okay. dollar. So, we'll so it's comparable, yep. thank you. So the, the one that was previously in place has basically all this boilerplate language with the exception of this one segment that's on the end by the signatures concerning the whistleblower policy. Correct. Is there anything in that policy as folks have looked at it that you find objectionable? Because I guess that would be the, the question for us as a board. Well, I can point out. Um, <laughs> uh, see, I think it's Article A, Paragraph 1, the last sentence. Attempts will be made to contact known sources of minority and women potential applicants to maximize the participation. Yeah. If, you read the, if you read the entire paragraph, I didn't see a reason for that being there because this is supposed to be an all-inclusive document, mm -hmm. and it seemed like that singled out a particular group of people uh, to actually emphasize on, which seemed, yeah. you understand what I'm saying? If it's supposed to be all inclusive. Yeah. Then why do you need that language? That's why do you need that language. The other, because they want you to solicit from, from women's owned or minority owned businesses. An equal yeah. opportunity document. Yeah, these are, this is um, with regard to employment. So we don't anticipate really employing anybody other than a consultant for this. But it doesn't mean yeah. just that this is the policy of the town. That's mm -hmm. what I want everybody to understand. It doesn't mean that yeah. we yeah. have to seek out minorities or women's own groups to do the study. It, it means what it says. If it's about employment, when we employ, we're supposed to seek out actively those mentioned groups that should be a, that should be a given based on the language prior to that but yeah. anyway but that's usually standard practice with your advertisements anyway isn't it equal opportunity well it, yeah. it depends on 
who reads it. Yeah. You know, there, is, there are sometimes, I mean, there have been grants, and I'm looking at Steve, I, I, we don't need to know which one, but there have been grants where, you know, we have been required to make sure that we sent a proposal to a business owned by women yeah. or minorities. You know, that's different than just saying equal opportunity employer. You know, it's seeking out as opposed to just accepting from every anyone that applies. And I don't think it will be difficult for us to implement this, but it is uh, the policy of the town that we're adopting, not just something for this grant. And uh, the, uh, my other question was the excessive force thing. Uh, mm -hmm. If you read that paragraph, um, it, it just came to mind that who determines if there's been a civil rights violation and uh, protests typically are supposed to be what civil, but there's been instances where a civil uh, protest can turn into hell. So um, if you let if authorities let somebody through the door and then all hell breaks loose, who's to blame? You know. Maybe I'm looking in, maybe I'm reading into this too much, but in today's world, there's no such thing as reading into it too much. Yeah. But those are my concerns. For that. Okay. Now the rest of the board has any concerns, then uh, uh, entertain a motion and move forward. I'll make a motion to adopt the MP1 as presented for the town of Waterbury. I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, those all in favor, please say aye. 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 And I abstain. So, yeah. 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 Did we just sign approve? Yes. Yeah. And get that back to Carl. Thank you. Sign it over here. Thanks, Carl. So, yeah, so, the next time I come up, it'll be we'll have a grant. Uh, agreement in place, and then we'll hopefully offer Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. The rest of the night's yours, Bill. <laughs> okay. Said with such a deep sigh. Um, I won't take anywhere near as long as Barb took. <laughs> we don't get to see her that often, so. Um, so, two quick things. Uh, I did not... I did not print this out for you or even send it to you. Uh, this first uh, item, the amendment to the solar, solar agreement for Sweetfield Solar Array, um, it's really a very minor change. As you know, there's a 500 kW solar array, array up on the Sweetfield that the village of Waterbury um, contracted with uh, Green Lantern for back in 2011 or 12. I can't remember exact year. Uh, and Green Lantern sold that off to a company from Colorado, AES. Um, and uh, they do business as the Village of Waterbury Solar One LLC. Uh, the off-takers of the solar array are the Edward Farrar Utility District, the Town of Waterbury, and the School District. And we entered into an agreement, and um, what, we're, what I'm asking to do is authorize me to sign an amendment to that agreement that simply shifts the way that we make payments uh, to them. Um, the town only makes or saves um, somewhere in the vicinity of three to five hundred dollars a year on this agreement. It's not a huge deal. Um, energy is produced. Um, credits from that energy hit the town uh, electric meters as well as the schools and the villages, and uh, and then because we don't own the array. Uh, we t turn around and we send 90% of the money for those credits back to AES, who, who built the array. They, they built it, they own it. So when this was enacted, it uh, was determined that 
that Waterbury would probably have to pay about uh, twenty about twenty six hundred dollars a year back to AES. The the value of the credits were estimated at about two thousand nine hundred and sixty uh, credits, and ninety percent of that uh, we would have to pay AES would be. $2,665, so the town was going to make or save $300 in electricity. Um, when Green Lantern entered into the agreement with us, uh, they had a mortgage on, on the, they had a loan to build the facility, and they wanted to make sure that they had a cash flow monthly to pay that loan. So the village has to pay them $8,400 a month. I'm not exactly sure what the school pays. Uh, I think it's about $1,000 a month or so. And the town has been paying AES $222 a month. And times 12 months, that's about $2,600. Uh, and then uh, the current contract says at the end of the year, uh, we're going to look at the amount of electricity that was produced what the value of the credits were, and then if, if it produced more electricity than we thought it would, uh, uh, we would end up having to pay more money. And if it produced less, uh, they might owe us something back. So we don't do that true up until uh, March or April now of the following year. So it's a calendar year contract on December 31st. Uh, we'll close the books, and then it takes them a couple months to gather all the information, and they look back. And last April or May, they sent us a bill and said, well, you owe us $1,044 more. And um, the fact that we owed them $1,044 more really me meant we saved more money than, than we, we thought we were going to, because, uh, you know, we got the other 10% of that, of that difference. So to the town, it's not that big of a deal. It's not hard for us to write a $222 check every single month. And then at the end of the year, the true up is $1,000 either way. But the village, uh, unfortunately, is they're paying $8,400 a, a year. And the village ended up getting about $35,000 back. $8,400 a year is a little more than $100,000. Um, a month, eighty-four hundred dollars a month is about a hundred thousand dollars, and then uh, the village didn't get anywhere near as much benefit from it as they thought. So they ended up having to they got a, a big credit, and for the village to have to write a check every single month for eighty-four hundred dollars, and then wait until May or April of the next March or April of the next year to get money back is is a big ask. So now what's going to happen, starting January 1st, if you approve this agreement, um, they will just send a bill for the credits, 90% of the credits that are generated that month. Now for the village, that's going to mean they're going to have a payment that goes like this. In the winter months, they're going to be paying a little. In the mm -hmm. summer months, they're going to be paying probably $30,000 or so. But they're going to pay as they go, and they won't have to have sitting in somebody else's bank a lot of their money. So it's a big deal for the village. It's not that big of a deal for the town, but all three entities really need to agree to the change. The school district agreed the other night, I think the night that you were there, whether you saw them vote on it or not, but uh, they sent the uh, contract back to AES today. The other thing that is changing in this contract um, I turned out to be uh, uh, too interested in making sure that the village and the town got treated fairly when we entered into this agreement. I wanted to make sure because it was the village's land and uh, the village had the, the, uh, the biggest costs for electricity, the wastewater treatment plant and the water treatment plant are two big users. I wanted to make sure that the power first went to the village. 
and then I wanted the power, any left over, so all the, all the credits would go to the village until the village meters couldn't take any more. And then I wanted it to go to the town, and then after the town, I wanted it to go to the school because some of the school people live in Duxbury, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why should they benefit? Um, on paper, that was a good, a good thing to do, to try to make sure all the credits went village, town, school. Unfortunately, what made the, the, uh, the monthly uh, payments askew, especially for the village, is that uh, we're not at the equator. So mm -hmm. in the winter months, there's, there's not enough <laughs> electricity being made. It was just hitting one meter. Yeah. And that meter got everything. And if you look at uh, this spreadsheet, you know, the, the town really got power in two months the rest of the time. There wasn't enough for the town to even get. So the, the agreement changes that, and there's an attachment to this contract, which basically lists all the town and village and school district meters. And you know, meter 8774, which is a town meter, is going to get 1.44% of the energy what generated is every month. Yeah. Uh, so if there's 500 kilowatt hours generated in January, the town will get 1.44% of that for that meter. And it will, again, it will take away these humps and ups and downs. So um, with that brief and confusing explanation, I would recommend that you uh, authorize me to sign this agreement. I'll answer questions yep. if you have them. But somebody would like to make that motion. I'll make a motion that we authorize Bill to sign the agreement. Is there a second? I, I second that. All righty. Does anybody have any further comments or questions? Nobody? No. Okay, I guess it was confusing. Then. Yeah, well, like, it was confusing when you said it was good that we were paying more because we were making yeah, more. It, it, yes. Yeah, the ups and downs and ins and outs are... Trials and tribulations. Why do you, why do you think... The bottom line is that it's a, <laughs> it's a prorated split now instead of loading one bucket yes, completely. That, not that I follow. So, Better to do yep. that than... That's why the people in the renewable energy back. business are making loads of money. <laughs> it's too confusing. Kind of like politics. All right. Motion has been made and seconded to uh, amend the solar array agreement for the Sweet Field Solar Array. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Um, letter B. This ties in a little bit with uh, Mark's question, Mark Fryer's question, when we had the uh, the first public hearing on the uh, town plan and this housing task force. Um, Alyssa came to see me uh, a week or so ago and let me know that, um, that Wendy Knight, the commissioner of uh, tourism and um, uh, Department of Tourism, tourism and Marketing for the state, had been uh, looking at a uh, research project uh, that they were going to uh, contract out, and they were looking at a proposal from a company by the name of Intopia, and it's a, uh, it's a short-term rental research project. So um, I talked with Alyssa a little bit, and um, Wendy's email, Commissioner Knight's email to Alyssa basically said that they were looking at a $15,000 project and uh, we're thinking that maybe some of the local communities could uh, come up with uh, together $5,000 towards this project. The, her department's budget has $10,000 in it. She was looking at a $15,000 project. And, and without reading all the emails uh, to you word for word, they were basically looking at Stowe as kind of the hub of where a lot of, more than likely, the short-term rental, Airbnb, if you will, are existing. And then they were looking at 
you know, maybe they could look at Waterbury, at Johnson, and at Cambridge, uh, those communities that surround uh, Stowe and, and on the other side of uh, Smuggler's Notch that has the ski area over there. So I looked at the Entopia proposal and, um, you know, the $15,000 project, um, I was a little bit concerned because it was a $15,000 project, but it was going to really analyze two of those four communities. So I sent an email to Commissioner Knight and I said, well, you know, if you're looking at the $15,000 project and you're looking for money, you know, from, from these other towns, uh, you know, splitting the $5,000 by four, it's about $1,375 each. But I said, the problem is you're going to analyze two communities. So we're all going to kick in $1,300. But what if you decide to look at Stowe and Johnson as opposed to Stowe and Waterbury? So I wondered whether it would be better for, um, you know, the four towns to kick in um, $1,375, and that generates $5,500, which was Intopia's first proposal, <laughs> lowest price proposal. And I said, after you get that information, then maybe you decide to go to the next step. So I sent her a, a fairly lengthy email expressing what my concerns were. And I said, I think we're interested in this based on the conversation that we had at, the, uh, at your last meeting when the planning folks were here, and then on your decision that you'd like to solicit folks for this housing task force. So I thought that you had kind of expressed enough interest that if this was going to go forward, I said I can probably find $1,300 right now if we had to. Anyway, after she saw my email and I think saw the concerns that I pointed out that the $15,000 project was only going to focus on two towns and you've got four towns. She pulled back a little bit and, uh, you know, she sent me an email back and said, you know, uh, thank you very much for your concerns. Um, we're going to adjust this a little bit and um, we're going to do a project with Intopia that kind of is a more baseline look uh, that will give us some information statewide. And then from that, we may decide to, uh, you know, come down from 50,000 feet to 20,000 feet. And at that time, uh, she said, <coughs> we might ask the towns for some, uh, some assistance if they wanted to, to be involved. And she said, what we probably would do is share the statewide information with a with towns where it seemed that this was an issue, and then ask the towns to join together and kind of move forward with a more expensive plan in the, in the state, rather than fund 10,000 of the more expensive plan, would maybe fund 5,000 of a more expensive plan and let the towns that were looking for the information to fund the rest of it. So there's nothing to approve tonight. It's my only question is, given that I'm starting to work on the budget, and you've talked about this task force, um, is this information the type that you might be interested in? And if so, I'd probably include in the budget maybe up to $5,000 to do something. I'm not here to make a proposal that we jump in with Intopia to do anything. I, the, the state is going to do something right now with their $10,000, and after they get their information, I'm sure they'll share that with us. We may want to move to a next step. So I'm just wondering if this is something that the board has any interest in or not. If not, it's easy. I can just drop it. If you have some interest, you know, I'll, I'll work with Alyssa to keep in contact with Commissioner Knight to see where they are in this process, and then we'll be able to make the next decision. But it might require having some money held somewhere that we can act, act with. So is the goal of this study, just to clarify, is to, to uh, try to determine the impact on the short-term Airbnb, if that's what you want to call them, uh, in the housing market? Is that what it's? 
Yeah, I, I think um, the, this, is, this is her email to Alyssa. The initial project would not include an assessment of how short-term impact, short-term rentals impact housing stock in, or, or availability in a community. However, the project would provide a benchmark for us to then f do a further analysis. So um, I don't have all the answers, Chris, to all these questions. It just seemed timely based on what we talked about before. And as I said, I felt based on what we discussed a couple weeks ago, that if they were looking for you know, $1,000 to $1,500 before the end of the year to put toward this program, I could probably find that and, and we would jump in for that minimal amount of money. Um, I think after her uh, reading of my email, she decided that, well, we need a little bit more baseline information before we can, um, we can assess that. The, uh, the proposal that they were thinking of, uh, which was the $15,000 proposal, option includes identification of individual online listings for Airbnb, HomeAway, VRBO, by using third-party technology, uh, develop an algorithm. It uses more resources and time to capture all necessary information. The purpose of this option is to provide a set of one-time statistical benchmarks of the current situation, gain more detailed information about um, RBOs, uh, uh, and then infer an approximation in annual lodging taxes and fees that are potentially not being collected from vacation rental marketplace. So I think the state is looking at this to make sure that there's a more level playing field between the vacation rentals and, and the traditional lodging facilities. Um, as I understand it, Airbnb is already supposed to be collecting those taxes. Whether they do or not, I don't no, know. No, actually, yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah, OK. Because I, maybe I should abstain from writing this, because I actually have an Airbnb in here. <laughs> I was going to say, are they authorized to pay the tax to the state? And is there any oversight? Whether well, is to okay. What happened was it used to be you had to send the tax in yourself quarterly as in self-report, and there was an agreement made with the state, and now it's just directly taken out, and the um, Airbnb host never sees that money; it just goes directly to Airbnb to the state. So. Correct me if I'm wrong, they also made you file a rooms and meals number for your property, and but Airbnb pays on behalf of that number. Yes, that's what it is. We have a number, but we don't have to pay the tax anymore. Right. So actually, it was, a, it was a win for the property owner who had that was the host, because we used to take 9% out of the revenue and mail it in quarterly, and now we charge the same amount and we pay a fee to Airbnb, but... Um, and the fee is, is charged to the customer and it goes directly to the state. So we get the same amount. So Mark, we get the full amount. I guess my question to you is I understand the concern. Um, what do you, what, do you, what would you propose? Well, I think I ultimately the hope would be to get there. an understanding of, of that impact. I understand that this study doesn't have it, but I think that there is a significant impact to supply demand in our community based on not only current properties switching over from long-term housing to short-term housing, but also um, the creation of additional properties for these short-term models, but also um, people going to our community to buy properties to also, not only people that already own that are transitioning to that, but people that are coming into the into the community and buying. I, I know it's definitely happening in Stowe, and I, I'm, I assume it's also happening here, is that there's a certain price point of home that is also being purchased for an income model that can be created via these short-term properties. So if we don't have a full understanding from a municipality of what that impact is, and we talk a lot about affordability, there are potentially things that we need to be doing to help with the demand side to keep affordability where it needs to be. Because I think when we look at data, for example, what's in the town plan, and it says, hey, well, our vacancy rates are good, but maybe they're not. 
and maybe they're actually unhealthy. And maybe we need to be doing more to make sure that housing units are created to help with the demand of who's actually living here and trying to work and live here, which also ultimately helps build Grand List and you know, further our ability to afford to live here and to, to pay out our budget for, for a town. So there's, there's a challenge there that I, I think Stowe recognizes is the, the problem is that there isn't, until recently, there wasn't a lot of the ability to, to actually understand how much that income was, was a self-reporting requirement. It, it was similar to Amazon saying, every year you're supposed to tell them how much you spent on Amazon and how many people were actually, you know, so there is more happening that I think there will be more visibility to understanding that. I think what it sounds like this is gonna do is they're gonna scrub all these sites that, cause I, I think Airbnb is following, but I don't know if the rule was that you know, is every single way that you can, right. you know, some people yeah. post on Craigslist, you know, like there's a bunch of other ways that you can so create income on short term that you can still maybe skirt the ability to report to the state. And so all of the income is probably not. And, and I don't know if this report will be able to do that as well, but I'm, I'm all for trying to, I think ultimately it, it's, a, it's a smart investment as a town to continue to learn what this impact is the dollars that it sounds like for this initial, it's, it's kind of unfortunate because it sounds like when you went to them and said, hey, if you're only going to pick two, this and then they're like, okay, we'll go this high. And you're like, well, great. Now, right. now it's almost like, why isn't the state just fully paying out the $15,000 if it's going to be this high? Yeah, the, the state, I, I think right now the state's going to do something for $10,000 to try to get some statewide information. Commissioner Knight called, called me the other day after I sent the email, and she said, wow, your email was, you know, kind of eye-opening, and those are kind of some of the things that we're thinking about, so we're, we're going to move away from this. We're going to pick kind of looking at two towns for $15,000, and we're just going to spend our money to get some information that's helpful to us kind of statewide. I don't know how yeah. much they're going to be able to get for $10,000 if they're going to look at the whole state. That's going to be my question. But I think what I'm saying is, um, you know, Alyssa and I will continue to monitor what's going on with this particular study from the state. We'll try to understand exactly what they're asking to get and we'll ask for, you know, it's going to be public information, obviously. We can get it. All I'm trying to do at this point is ask that once that state, um, uh, the state-funded study is done, it may help identify some areas that might be easy things for us to look at. I mean, I, to, to get everything that you're looking for, I think is, you know, that's going to be a really big project. Sure. And I think I'm just asking, is this something that you're ask us to continue to monitor and maybe put $5,000 in the budget for some type of housing study mm -hmm. next year. And then we can, maybe we can collaborate with Stowe um, and the state and, and, you know, leverage our money that way. That's all I'm trying to find out right now. I don't, I don't have a specific yeah. scope of work in mind at the present time. Now, based on, on what you were saying before, I mean, it would make sense that they create some sort of um, uh, solution with an algorithm just to pulse what's out there for information and kind of create a, a heat map of the state, for lack of a better word, that would give them at least a starting point of where stuff is and then be able to hone in on it. But I think it it is in our best interest to be prepared to try to do something like that if we can be a little more surgical in our area. I mean, basically, you're at, I, I absolutely support it. I think if we just put 5000 aside for the potential of being able to buy into the data that is important to us, I think that, that absolutely is something that we should consider. Um, yeah, I would imagine that once they create the software that allows them to, to scan these websites and try to get as much data, I'd imagine it's just like zoom in. Like, I'd imagine that it would be much easier than to pull some localized data as these websites build that within to their, their own algorithms when you go tr try to book a place is that you pick a, a radius dependent yeah. you know, choice. So I would imagine 
that information potentially could be a done rather easily once they build design whatever they need to do to be able to start to try to create those quantities and and just what that data is so I mean, I, I fully support it, and I, I would say that I would hope that we could we could have that information. I think it's going to be really important in the future. Well, I could see the research and monitoring of this uh, issue being uh, relatively easy compared to the solution. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned in the other one, there are communities in the U.S. that have... <clears throat> Created and, and I think some of it, unfortunately, has gone to the state Supreme Courts. I, I know Austin, Texas, created rules surrounding new real estate and, and the ability to rent it for certain periods of time to try to curb new construction fully focused on short-term rentals. So, But it, I, I did recently read something that it either was at, at or already out of the Supreme Court, potentially was challenged and won that you can't do that. So I don't know out if that's a state issue or, or you know, specific to the state, but I know that communities are trying to slow some of this to try to create order. Cause like, you know, imagine, I mean, Stowe's a great example of like, it's completely different even up there in terms of what short-term housing is doing to their real estate market. Imagine if you're anywhere else in the United States that's a, a super popular tour and trying to live amongst that is, it, you know, we see those challenges here and it's, it's gonna continue, I think, as Vermont becomes a very tourist focused state and hospitality and tourism is one of the largest economic drivers of what's happening in the state. We're, we're, we should be ready for that because of our, you know, our locale compared to Stowe, and we're on that exit and that corridor. And I had a gentleman just tell me the other day that uh, he was going to start uh, advertising his property as, you know, for Airbnb, and uh, he had somebody come along that was willing to give him more than what he was going to get through that process for an entire year. And only be here on weekends. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, he didn't hesitate. You know, it's just, it's, I don't understand where people are getting their money, but I guess they don't live here. Only on weekends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, they want to live here full time. I guess that's their goal. But Bill, did you want? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I think Alyssa, do you have something? No, I was just oh, going to add to okay. Mark's point. I think the biggest thing is just having the data. We don't know what percent of the housing stock is. You know, I think the state has an angle that in some ways has to do with revenue and taxes, as Bill alluded to. But I think locally, like Mark said, part of it is just if we're looking to staff a housing task force, whether it's Steve or I or whoever down the line, knowing we have X units of housing and is it 5, 10, 15, 25 percent? I'm going to start. <laughs> I knew as soon as I started. Um, it's just understanding what percentage of Waterbury's housing stock may or may not be involved. Having that, even if it is a static benchmark to start, I think would be really helpful in that. So that was, I think, the lens of bringing it to Bill initially was just, and you know, Bill was going, if you can get this data for this amount of money, like that would be great. Versus again, one of us doing it on our time and without the. Um, technical expertise. So I think that was just kind of the impetus initially was that it would be a good way to get some data right off the bat um, so that we know more. And that hopefully the proposal tweaks in a positive direction in the future. Thanks. Well, if the board's in favor of, you know, at least tentatively. Yeah. Sticking that number in the budget. Yeah, I don't think you need to make a motion tonight. I just wanted to bring this to your attention, see if it was something that this kind of angle was of interest. And when we get into the budget process, we'll, we'll talk about it again. But uh, I think it's an issue that we need some information And it's about. an interesting conversation to continue to put pressure on the state to take it seriously and understand our concerns and have them spend a little bit more than even $10,000 on researching this a little bit more. I think that's a small number for the impact that it's doing to the state right. and ultimately could could be profitable <laughs> well, we for have the to state and communities. Go interagency about this because obviously the Department of Tourism 
has a different interest than the folks who are worried about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm sitting yeah. down with Phil Scott on Wednesday, so well, I'll mention it. Good. Mention <laughs> it to it. Do you suppose there just a question there that there'd be uh, some form of a fee that would uh, impact fee that would go towards communities based on those types of rentals rentals yeah I think again that with the level the playing field question mark is if you select them out specifically as impact fees then you know they, they might say well why aren't you charging the hotels or you know like there's I think there's a yeah. diff, there's a yeah yeah, I think let's just start by hoping that the state can figure out how to make sure that everyone's paying their proper taxes and then maybe there's some easy numbers that can be back calculated on usage. <laughs> Identifying properties just through requiring properties to register and pay their taxes on income. I'd be curious to know what the state's getting in current taxes through that process right now through Airbnb. You don't know. Just you, had a press yeah. release. I think that so if you Google Vermont Business Tax and Airbnb, I think they just came out. I'm sure it's much more than last year. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It's going to be my top nine percent of where everything. Okay. 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 So that, there's no other items then. Uh, somebody can make a motion to get out of here. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.